Succes i veterinær praksis, podcast nummer 112. Jeg Søren Pejstrup her. Det er mig, der har startet projektet Succes i veterinær praksis. Det er for det første et projekt, der består af den her podcast, du lytter til lige nu. Den er gratis at abonnere på, og det kan du gøre i en app på din telefon, og så får du helt automatisk nye episoder hver eneste søndag. For det andet, så er det et e-mail nyhedsbrev med fokus på fagligt relevant indhold med protokoller og pdf-downloads og tips og tricks til dyrlæger og særligt interesserede veterinærsygeplejersker. Det kan du tilmelde dig over på hjemmesiden, hvis du vil være med. Og så for det tredje, så er det en serie af online-kurser med nogle helt specifikke læringsmål. De koster lidt at få adgang til, men som podcastlytter, så kan du få adgang de første fire uger helt gratis. Så kan du se, om det er noget for dig at melde dig fra igen, hvis ikke det er. Du får de fire uger gratis over på hjemmesiden på sivpdk 4 uger. I dag skal vi snakke om noget, der er utrolig vigtigt for rigtig mange af os, og for noget, der er forholdsvis almindeligt for os at stå med. Vi skal nemlig snakke om opvågningen efter narkose. Og som vi også snakker om i dagens interview, så er det måske ikke lige frem det, der er mest i fokus for os dyrlærer i hvert fald, men for jer veterinærsygeplejersker, så er det måske meget i fokus, fordi det er netop er det, I står med. Der er i hvert fald noget at lære for os alle sammen her, og for os dyrlæger måske lidt at få øjnene op for, at der er nogle detaljer, vi ikke overser, og for jer sygeplejersker er der måske lidt, at I kan blive afstiget i, at det I gør er rigtigt, og måske få et par tips og tricks med, som I ikke havde tænkt på. Jeg har interviewet Darcy Prammer, som du måske kan høre på navnet, er fra USA. Hun har uddannet sig særligt i det her og står med de her opgaver hver eneste dag. Så hun er den helt rigtige til at formidle lige netop det her. Der er links og noter over på hjemmesiden. Som sædvanligt, det her er afsnit nummer 112, så dem finder du på sivp.dk-112. Og så over til dagens interview. Hej Darcy, and welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. So um, we too have been talking a little bit about uh, today's topic on email, and I'd like you to to tell me why you feel the topic is so important in just a second. Um, I've talked to some of your colleagues, but I think it would be a good idea if you give you um, an introduction to yourself so we know who you are and where you work. Sure. Okay. Um, my name is Darcy Palmer, and I am a credentialed veterinary technician, and I have been a VTS or veterinary technician specialist in anesthesia and analgesia since 2006. Um, the majority of my work experience has been in a university teaching hospital, uh, but I currently work in a small one boarded surgeon specialty practice now, so kind of trying my hand at something else, and I really enjoy that aspect of as well. Um, but ultimately, um, I love teaching and I love learning, um, and so that's one of the things that I've really tried to focus on in my career, so I do... Um, several courses online teaching. I try to go and uh, speak um, at conferences and that kind of thing. And then, of course, uh, being involved in the Veterinary Anesthesia Nerds Facebook page has um, really been something that I'm passionate about as well. And we talked a little bit about uh, what today's topic is uh, was going to be. Uh, and As a vet, I'm focused on uh, what kind of medication to give my patients and how to run the anesthesia, and not I don't worry too much about the recovery period. But uh, I, I fairly quickly got the sense that you you felt you're you're feeling this is a very important topic. So um, uh, please uh, enlighten me <laughs> or, or tell me why this is so important. Sure. Well, I. Um There was a study that came out in the Veterinary Anesthesia and Analgesia Journal in 2008, and the study is known as the SEPSAF study, which is the Confidential Inquiry into Perioperative Small Animal Fatalities, um, and this was a, a very large-scale study that was based out of the United Kingdom. 
And um, there was over they they the study period was over two years, and a lot there was like 120 something veterinary hospitals that participated in this study, and so they had a large population of animals. So we know that there's you know good grounds for the information that they collected because of the study size. Mm -hmm. But what this study showed is that the post-operative death rate was almost 50% in dogs and over 60% in cats and rabbits. And so what this is telling us, and, and the most likely time for these patients to die was within the three hours after the procedure was done. So, and so uh, when our patients die in um, in uh, or during anesthesia they will actually half of them will actually die in the recovery period in the recovery period yes okay. yes that's correct so, or at least that's what this study is indicating mm -hmm. to us uh, and so what the, what this the basis of this study was basically that we need to do a much better job of watching our patients in recovery until they make what we call a full recovery um to try to decrease this percentage um, that this study showed us. Yeah. So, and, and I think it is something, you know, the surgeon is, is focused on as soon as the incision is closed, they are out and they're, you know, moving on to the next case and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, as soon as the inhalant is turned off, the patient is extubated and the patient's put in a cage and they're never looked at again until the evening rounds. And so what we're, sh what, this study and is showing us is that we need to be much more vigilant in watching them immediately in recovery, um, at least, especially up to three hours post-op. Yeah. So the, the yeah well the the most scary scenario. Um, I, I I remember a case where um, a, um, we had a a dog in for some elective uh, surgery and it was uh, fairly. A simple, straightforward case, and um, uh, when the owner came uh, in the afternoon to pick up the dog, uh, we were following uh, the uh, the owner out, to, and we usually do that to to show the owner where the the dog has been for the whole day, <laughs> and then the dog was dead in the the cage, oh, uh, no. the <laughs> and no, <laughs> nobody had uh, have seen it. Uh, the nobody the nurse the did uh, actually check it, to, uh, not too. <laughs> too long before the owner came and it seemed to be fine there but it uh, somehow died when we turned our backs that that was just yeah. one case but it's still something that shouldn't happen Ab absolutely and, and i think it happens more often or more frequently than what people want to believe mm -hmm. so I, I think that's kind of why this topic became something that i was passionate about to kind of get the word across because you know, re recovery period is often a forgotten period, and it's it's likely due to the fact that you know we have a set schedule to stay to, and so it's get done with that surgery, get the animal off the table, and let's get going with the next case. Well, yes. that that case that just came off the table needs some attention, and so and and I think um, I do some consulting work where if a practice wants. An individual to come into their to their practice and provide extra training, and at least on anesthesia, that's one thing that I like to do. And so, I I saw, and even starting um, in the practice I'm at now, you take for granted of how specific you ask people to do things in recovery. But in this in this practice, it was really common for them to lay a patient on the floor, still intubated, mm -hmm. and they were running around getting the next patient going. Well, that patient was there on the ground with no one watching it, still intubated. And so there's a whole host of problems that can happen in that scenario when a patient is not being watched immediately after. And so, you know, you talk about the endotracheal tube, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the patient suddenly waking up and biting that tube in half, you know, that's just the start of the problems that can occur in recovery. I mean, you can go on to, if they're not adequately breathing, um, then hypoventilation can easily lead to hypoxemia when all their breathing is room air, 21% oxygen. And so I think people take for granted how quickly those things can occur and cause a significant issue like an arrest to happen just simply by not watching the patient, even for the first 10 minutes after 
they've turned off the inhalant. Yeah. So for uh, definition purposes, is the recovery period uh, when you turn off the inhalant? Well, it's so you're going to there are um, several different definitions that can define that. But this study, the SEPSAF study, um, defined it as the end of the procedure, mm -hmm. which we assume that the end of the procedure is also when the inhalant is turned off. So most people will interpret that data as saying when the inhalant is turned off, the recovery period starts. Yeah. yeah well, as sometimes the nurse would have to do some cleaning up. If it's me who's operating anyway, <laughs> and and maybe is uh, do some nail trimmings or have some other small jobs, but usually we will turn off the inhalant when the the surgery is done. Yes, yes, and so that's kind of I mean, give and take you know fifteen minutes on on that side for yeah. finishing up things like you just mentioned. Yeah, certainly. So, yeah. but I, I think as a rough estimate or as rough definition, you can say at the end of procedure when the inhalant is turned off. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. So, uh, to uh, just to take it, uh, maybe to follow the patient from the uh, operating theater to when the the owner picks it up. Um, so the first thing is actually you would keep it on uh, oxygen as long as it's possible. Uh, well, I I recommend that for a couple reasons. Um, so once the inhalant is turned off. Um, allowing them to breathe 100% oxygen for just a couple minutes does two things. One, it can help dilute out the inhalant faster, so it speeds up recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, and two, and the main benefit that I, f I feel it provides is that it acts as a way to continue scavenging that waste anesthetic gas or the WAG so that the person standing there recovering the patient isn't inhaling all of that waste anesthetic gas that the patient is breathing off. Mm -hmm. So you're utilizing your scavenging system um, while providing them with 100% oxygen. So it's beneficial to the patient to kind of dilute out the inhalant, speed up recovery, but it's also beneficial from our standpoint of not being exposed to excessive waste anesthetic gas. Um, but of course, if – so I recommend – providing them 100% oxygen for three to five minutes. Uh, but certainly if that patient is ready to extubate before that time frame, please do so. You don't mm -hmm. want to delay extubation just to provide them with oxygen. If, if they're coming to and they're showing signs of consciousness, definitely extubate them. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and that's uh, another thing you mentioned, the extubation. Um, and we shouldn't turn our backs on the patients, even though it's uh, tempting. Absolutely, yes. And and I've um, unfortunately witnessed it myself um, on several occasions where people will leave an intubated patient to go grab something that they need, not realizing that that patient was awake enough to start chewing the tube or move their head. And all it takes is one bite down on that tube. And if that, if the distal end of that tube is aspirated back down into the lungs, mm -hmm. then, you know, your only option is to reanesthetize and use a, a bronchoscope to go retrieve that tube. So, yeah. um, I'm sure lots of people have some horror stories about that. I've, I had one of my own, um, it was a puppy and I had just started in anesthesia and, um, I was, um, getting ready to extubate and without warning that dog just sprung up and bit the tube and me without thinking, I just shoved my hand down his throat and grabbed the end of the tube. Thankfully he, he bit the tube, um, just a little bit behind the connector. So there was still quite a bit of tube that I was able to grab, but I, um, I reached down there and grabbed that tube, the rest of the tube, and pulled it out. But to this day, that tube, I, I um, took packaging tape and taped that to a cardboard piece mm -hmm. and hung it on the wall in the anesthesia prep room of what not to do. <laughs> and to this day, so 18 years later, that, that picture still hangs in the prep room of yeah. what can happen if you know, you're not 100% focused on that patient waiting for them to show signs to be extubated. But I would think sometimes we, um, as vets, maybe feel that we're doing our patients a favor by leaving the tube in, even though we are busy and have other things to do, uh, just to uh, secure the airways. But uh, it's not uh, necessarily a benefit. 
Sure, sure. Now, and I, I could definitely see that, you know, ex- especially with brachycephalic breeds, you want, you know, those guys love having a patent airway to mm-hmm. breathe. And so we let them keep their tube for as long as possible. Um, but it's kind of a slippery slope walking because as soon as they become conscious and, and want to start chewing that tube, mm-hmm. we need to get that, we need to be ready and prepared to extubate them right away. Uh, otherwise, it could have negative consequences. Mm-hmm. And I know uh, to ask this because you um, you sent me a, a, a paper to read before we uh, we're going to talk here. And I know you're you're writing about um, regurgitations. Um, can you talk a little bit about those as well? Sure, sure. Um, so gastroesophageal reflex is always a concern during recovery, and it can actually happen at any time during the anesthetic period, but we tend to notice it most when we get ready to look at our patient and um, start the recovery process. Um, The thing about gastroesophageal reflex is that um, there's no clear defined risk factors that predispose a patient to gastroesophageal reflux. We know that a lot of our anesthetic drugs, uh, including the inhalants, have been linked to causing a decrease in gastroesophageal tone, um, and therefore fluid can more easily move from the stomach into the esophagus. Um, But because there are no defined risk factors, it's very difficult for us to um, predict when it's going to happen in one patient versus another. And a lot of the times the fluid volume is so small that it goes unrecognized. Um, And so we don't see any clinical signs that are apparent. But if the volume is in a large enough amount, um, it can make its way all the way to the pharynx, and that is when you're going to see the clinical signs of regurgitation. So it's usually like a brownish, um, can be yellowish fluid that is coming from the oral cavity, and in some cases it can come from the nasal cavity as well. Mm-hmm. But if you see this and you see a large enough volume of it, it can actually put the patient at an increased risk for aspiration if you don't take care of it before they recover. Mm-hmm. Um, So one of the things that I recommend doing is getting into the habit of um, looking, examining the oral cavity before you turn off the inhalant. Because if signs of regurgitation are present, that is something that, um, of course, it's the DVM's call, but that is something that you're going to want to treat and take care of before you turn off the inhalant and recover your patient. Yeah. Um, and is that uh, also what you call a silent regurgitation? So silent regurgitation would be what if the um, amount is in a small amount. So it might make its way up the esophagus, but yet not actually make it into the pharynx to where we see uh, clinical signs of it occurring. So there is um, some clinicians out there who believe that silent regurg is present in all of our patients uh, simply because – most of our anesthesia drugs are decreasing that gastroesophageal tone. And so some amount of reflux is going to be present. Um, And it's called silent regurg if it doesn't actually make its way all the way to the oral cavity Mm -hmm. for us to see the the clinical signs. Um, There have been a couple studies. I don't know the details, unfortunately, but I do know that some um, studies have looked at – assessing the pH of that fluid uh, oh. that's in the esophagus mm-hmm. um, that way to just kind of see what the incidence is of silent regurg and how often it does occur. Yeah. So where I work, I would usually have turned my back to the patient at this point uh, because I'm writing on the computer or doing something else. And uh, the nurse will uh, obviously uh, keep an eye on the patient. Um, sure. But... but uh, she should make a habit out of looking into the mouth and and maybe to the bottom of the pharynx as well. Sure, sure. So what, um, you know, just doing a quick assessment to look in the oral cavity, um, some people will take a dry gauze and kind of dab the sides of the cheek and, and dab towards the back of where the endotracheal tube entering the trachea and see if you get any kind of brownish fluid on that gauze. And if you do, then that tells you that regurg is present and then you can move forward with 
treating it prior mm-hmm. to and, and you know something like that where if it's if it's not actively flowing out of the patient's mouth um, just simply wiping the oral cavity might be enough to to treat that particular case would you rinse it as well so um, so that if so there's a couple different um, thought processes on mm-hmm. this. I worked for one anesthesiologist who f- did not treat for um, regurgitation, even if he saw it in um, large amounts. Um, but he, and the reason for that is because he felt that treatment could actually increase the risk of aspiration um, simply doing the treatment. And then there's other anesthesiologists who are on the other side of the spectrum that believe that if you see clinical signs, so any brownish fluid whatsoever, if you don't treat by just flushing the oral cavity and flushing the esophagus with just saline, uh, you increase the risk of causing esophagitis. Um, in worst case scenarios, you can um, lead to esophageal strictures. And so clinicians who have experienced cases that have gone on to have esophageal strictures definitely are proponents for treating mm-hmm. um, just by simple, simply flushing. Um, and there's, there's quite a bit of evidence out there to show that treating um, the regurg um, and flushing the oral cavity is beneficial. Mm-hmm. So that's definitely the way that I, um, if, if I see it, I will definitely go ahead and flush. Mm-hmm. Would you use uh, medication as well? And I know it's, um, it's going to be the vet's call, of course, but would you ad- advise me to use... Sh- Sure. I, I'm um, a big, you know, I, I, this, if you see clinical signs of regurgitation, I think that it's worth um, considering like um, the histamine 2 antagonist like famotidine. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the one that I have the most experience with. Um, there's other clinicians who will do like proton pump inhibitors like omiprazole. Some will consider sequelfate. Um, But I don't think that there's any good evidence out there to show that any of these drugs will prevent regurg from happening. So there's no point in pre-treating with them. Uh, But certainly if you see signs of um, regurgitation, I think famotidine would be the one that I have the most... um, experience with using Mm -hmm. so and if anything you know just to kind of help reduce the acidity of the fluids i think is beneficial all right so let's uh, let's say that uh, we rinsed the the brown fluid out and we have uh, somehow managed to take out the the whole uh, intratracheal tube Uh, uh, what is um, uh, where do we go from there so we've extubated the patient Mm mm-hmm Okay, so um, once they are um, extubated, then what I would recommend doing is just observing that patient as often as you feel necessary based on whatever their presenting complaint is uh, until they make what I would call a full recovery. And I know you're, there's a lot of definitions, different definitions out there, but the way that I define it is that that patient is able to sit sternal if their condition allows and all of their vital signs are within normal limits. So that's everything right down to temperature. Um, if they are hypothermic, then you should be providing some kind of external heat source and then closely monitoring their temperature until it gets up to above 99 degrees Fahrenheit. So um, I would have somebody checking that temperature at least every 15 to 20 minutes, um, making sure that that temperature is in fact increasing. But then also, I don't want them to get too hot as well. I don't want them, you know, I don't want them the temperature to be 102 before we turn off um, the active heat source. Uh, So we're going to monitor that very closely until that time frame. And then at the same time, we're also assessing the patient for pain um, and, um, you know, just overall well-being in the cage. Are they comfortable, um, you know, making sure that they're not trying to get up and move around? Um, So... Yeah, so those mm-hmm. those are kind of things that I would do immediately after putting the patient in the cage. Yeah, but the temperature is um, is fairly important. Yes, I, I would say that, uh, you know, uh, again, this is one of the 
areas where once the patient is excavated and put in the cage, it can often easily be forgotten. And if that patient was cold coming off of the surgery table or the procedure table, then without an active heat source, they're not going to be able to get their temperature up on their own. They mm-hmm. need some kind of external heat source provided for them. And if they're just put back into a cage in a room and the doors closed, um, they can get very, very cold. And the more cold that they get, that can start having a negative impact on their cardiovascular system, their respiratory system, you know, just overall, all of their systems are basically affected by, by them being cold. Mm-hmm. And then uh, you're, um, you're talking about um, uh, pain management as well. I talked to one of your colleagues, Tasha Madnoni, in, in podcast. Yes. Uh, uh, and in an earlier podcast, so maybe we shouldn't go too <laughs> too much into depth depth here. But can you give us uh, maybe an overview overview? Sure, I I think that. Um A lot of people forget that once a patient is conscious, their vital signs alone are not um, specific indicators of pain. Um, And that is simply due to the fact that once they're conscious, cortisol can play a role. So if they're stressed, then their heart rate can be elevated and they may or may not be painful at that time. So in the recovery period, um, we tend to... Um, make sure that people know to rely more on behavior signs. Mm -hmm. Uh, So for instance, um, I have a really good case where it was a, it was a dog that had a very invasive liver mass and um, this dog was really painful in surgery. And so I was giving opioid CRIs, um, lidocaine CRIs, ketamine CRIs. um, And so everything you know, I managed the case just fine. Well, I sent that case to ICU and I waited until they were extubated and I left the patient in the cage. Well, I moved on to the next case Mm -hmm. and I came back about an hour later and my dog is standing. But my dog was standing and he was so tired that he was swaying back and forth in the cage, refusing to lie down. And to the, he was so exhausted to the point where he was resting his teeth on the cage door just to kind of help prop himself up to stay, to stay standing. Hmm. And I looked at the ICU techs and I was like, what is going on here? And they're like, oh, well, we tried to get him to, to go outside and go to the bathroom. We thought, you know, that might be the issue. Um, but once we got him out of the cage, he just stood there and didn't want to move. And I looked at him and I said, guys, this guy is painful. He's, he's standing an hour after a big major invasive surgery like this. Mm-hmm. This is not okay. So I immediately went and had a conversation with the doctor and we increased the opioid CRI. We added in a dexmedetomidine CRI and added back in the lidocaine CRI. And within 20 minutes of starting those CRIs, that dog curled up, laid down and then slept for the rest of the afternoon. (laughs) And so behavior is, is a big part of pain that I think anybody who is involved in monitoring recovering patients needs to have a keen ability to note when a patient's behavior is not normal. And and then as technicians, as nurses who are monitoring these patients, it is our job to be advocates for these patients and go inform mm-hmm. the DVMs because you guys are all moved on to the next case as you yeah. should. Yeah. And so it's our job to, when we see something that is not normal or that we don't think is normal, we need to be be having a conversation with, with that doctor. And pain should be high on the differential list as something that we look at addressing if they're not acting abnormal. So um, reluctance to lie down. Um, or move is a sure sign of pain. They might have a heightened sense of anxiety. They may or may not be vocal. Um, there's a lot of work now on facial expressions um, that is coming out for dogs and cats, especially showing that you know a squinted eye position can be a, a real good sign of pain in cats. Um, and then, of course, um, actually palpating the surgical area can also be uh, an indication if they respond or they look at you while you are palpating that site, that is a a very good sign of 
the potential for pain. Mm -hmm. So behavior signs overall are are definitely something that I would go off of more than vital signs. But in in behavior, uh, oftentimes I would think of uh, more uh, vocal dogs to be in more pain, but your patient was quiet. Yes, yes. And that is um, that is definitely something that it's going to be different for all patients. Um, and so vocalization alone does not necessarily indicate pain. I mean, it, it could, but, um, you know, if, if they're just doing a, a minor whining um, or something like that, you know, immediately in recovery, that could also indicate emergence delirium as well. Mm-hmm. So it might not be a tell sign of of pain but what i say is that when in doubt or if you're questioning if it is or not pain just treat Mm -hmm. just give some more analgesics because i would rather err on the side of providing pain management to that patient and seeing what happens rather than second guess myself and allow them to continue being in pain Mm -hmm. So I, I feel the same. I have red hair, so I'm allowed to be. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, well, I'm I'm allowed to ask for more pain medications, but uh, we are all different, of course. Yes. Yeah. I think actually the the thing with the red hair has been uh, disproven uh, uh, again, but no, <laughs> I still use it. I have a redheaded son, so that's that's interesting to know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, but uh, uh, what I also hear you say is uh, palpating the patient. I actually opening the cage door. <laughs> um, it might seem obvious, but it's uh, maybe it's not. Yeah, I, I think that it is important to assess the patient, both just observing them and what they're doing without physical contact, but then definitely put your hands on that patient. I mean, it might be something that they're whimpering in their cage because they have their foot caught up underneath them and they can't get into a comfortable position and merely repositioning them and they fall asleep. So putting your hands on the patient, doing some palpation around the surgical incision, noting the response that the patient shows you, all of those things um, should be used in the overall assessment of what you decide is if your patient is painful or you know, something else was, was wrong. Mm-hmm. And um, you, I always have trouble saying this, and it's difficult enough for me in Danish, and English is even worse, <laughs> but you use dexmedetomidine? Yeah, please yes, help me. Yes, yeah, dexmedetomidine. Thank yes, you. yes. Um, dexmedetomidine is a sedative, and it also has analgesic properties. Uh, and so... Um, you know, if, if I have a patient that is vocalizing and, um, you know, I, so there's a couple, there's a couple different things that I would do if I think the patient is painful immediately post-op and the time period from the last time that they got an analgesic agent in surgery has lapsed, I will go ahead and provide them with another dose of opioid in the post-op recovery period. Uh, But if I think that they um, are just experiencing a little bit of emergence delirium, maybe they're just whiny coming out of the effects of the inhalant. um, And let's say I just gave another dose of opioids in surgery 30 minutes ago. If they wake up and they're a little bit... um, vocalizing and they just don't seem like they really are aware of their surroundings, a microdose of dexmedetomidine providing that they are heart healthy uh, is been a game changer. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so microdose to me would be one microgram per kilo. Um, And so that, that will just allow them to just chill out, rest comfortably and take a little bit longer for the effects of the inhalant to wear off. Mm -hmm. But we usually uh, think of it as uh, more like a sedative that we give in in a higher dose if we're we're going to do small procedures or uh, something else. But certainly, you're, you're you're giving like not even a tenth of what we usually use. Correct. Yeah. So these these microdoses. In fact, I use them. I use microdoses of dexmedetomidine uh, in heart healthy patients uh, intraop all the time as well. So if I have a patient that uh, gets stimulated um, 
and where I find it most beneficial is when their respiratory rate speeds up. All your other vital signs might be hanging out um, within normal range, but if the surgeon does something and they respond by increasing their respiratory rate or they start panting, adding in a microdose of dexmedetomidine will just chill them back out, allow them to start breathing at a good controlled rate again, and then everything just kind of ticks along. So I'm a big proponent of the micro doses, and, and definitely it's, it's a much smaller dosage compared to what you would use for uh, conscious sedation. Mm-hmm. So it, and you're basically not going to give it as uh, so much that you're going to sedate the the the, the patient in recovery. I mean, it can on on some patients where I've given a microdose and and certainly their eyes will go back down medial ventral and they'll lay there flat. And to for me right now, it's actually beneficial because a lot of my orthopedic cases go immediately into radiology for post-op rads. And so they need that patient to be holding still. Mm -hmm. So if my patient extubates five minutes after I turn off the inhalant, then they're going to be struggling with that patient experiencing some emergence delirium while they're trying to take post-op rad. So mm-hmm. I will provide them with just a microdose of dexmedetomidine and that will allow the patient to relax and allow them to get their their rads without them moving around. And then most of my patients, after I give that, the thing about using microdoses is that it's very short duration of action. So even if you fully relax them and they seem like they go back asleep. As soon as you stimulate them to move them into their cage, they usually arouse back enough to where they're sitting sternal by the time you're putting them in their cage. So you're not Mm. completely flattening them out. You're just kind of taking the edge off of them. Yeah. And there's, of course, a wide range of uh, pharmaceuticals we can use here, opioids and NSAIDs and and everything else. Is there... Uh, some of them that you feel is more important that we uh, should absolutely mention here? Uh, For recovery period? Yes. Um, So I I think that it is most, it's going to be most beneficial to the patient if you are providing a multimodal analgesic protocol right from the start. Mm -hmm. You're going to get a much smoother recovery if you have pain addressed at a lot of different time points along that pain pathway. So having a multimodal analgesic plan on board initially is going to smooth out recovery to the point where, um, you know, they're just going to sleep it off Mm -hmm. and be comfortable for the rest of their stay in the hospital. Um, But um, so I would say, you know, if the patient uh, woke up rough, certainly reaching for drugs that are fast acting are going to be the best choices. So you're looking at your opioids and then a heart healthy patient, I would consider dexmedetomidine. Um, a lot of doctors, um, I think I'm seeing a trend now where a lot of surgeons, at least for orthopedic cases and the patient that's otherwise healthy to start are giving NSAIDs in the preoperative period. Um, but if they are not, then certainly that is something to, uh, provide in the post-op period as well, because that's going to address inflammation and act at different locations on the pain pathway than opioids, Mm -hmm. uh, and dexmedetomidine. And so, um, addressing that inflammatory component of pain in the post-op period, having that inset is going to be really beneficial. So certainly I would consider that. And then if you're, if you're dealing with a patient that had significant trauma or underwent a very extensive surgery, that's when I would look at providing um, CRIs, continuous rain infusions of drugs. So definitely have an opioid, but then also consider things like lidocaine and ketamine, um, and then you can also do a, a CRI of dexmedetomidine as well. But mm-hmm. for at least for the first 24 hours, patients that are um, significant to severely painful, definitely adding CRIs of all different kinds of drug combinations is definitely going to be the way to, yeah. to go for those. Yeah. So usually we would also to basically all surgeries send the home send home some NSAIDs uh, as well just for a couple of days. 
Yes, yes. And I think a lot of a lot of people, you know, especially now, I don't know if you guys are experiencing this, but the we're in a pretty big opioid crisis over here mm-hmm. where um, the injectable opioids are becoming very sparse to get a hold of. Uh, and so in the recovery period, for sure, the NSAIDs have become a staple drug to send home, you know, for three to seven days post-op. And in some cases, um, some procedures, that's all they really need to be sent home with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, I've, uh, we usually use um, or sometimes use as a promising uh, in the, the pre-meds, but um, do you use that in recovery period as well? You certainly can. I would just use it at reduced dosages. Uh, so if I were going to reach for acepromazine, I would be using like 0. 0.01 mg per kg um, for my, I guess I would consider that a microdose of acepromazine post-op. And that can work just as well as dexmedetomidine can and just kind of taking the edge off of them. Because your, your, your goal for using those drugs in recovery is not to completely flatten them back out Mm -hmm. because as soon as that wears off, if they're painful, they're just going to be painful again. So the point is just to kind of take the edge off of them so that they can uh, get their whereabouts to them coming off of that. I think we take for granted how much emergence delirium a patient can experience just from the inhalants alone. And um, I think that by providing just a little bit of a microdose of a sedative agent helps them come through that emergence delirium much, much smoother. Mm-hmm. All right. So, yeah, certainly either one of those sedative agents can be used. And I know, of course, uh, because this also comes up from time to time in your Facebook group, that uh, people are actually <laughs> discussing uh, what to use. And, and I can see that people are using <laughs> a very wide range of um, uh, uh, different yeah, pharmaceuticals or uh, medications. Yes. <laughs> yeah, there there's definitely a lot of... And that's not to say that anything is, you know, one is... I don't think that there's any one drug that we use in anesthesia that I would say is a big contraindication, speaking in general terms. I mean, certainly when you start talking about specific cases, there's going to be drugs that are contraindicated. But in the most part, as long as you are using clinically acceptable dosages and understand the effects of the drugs, there's there's very few contraindications mm. of, of, using, of using drugs in a general sense. Yes. I think we should also take some time to talk about your Facebook group and maybe your online courses. And and I know you have been involved in organizing a, a conference as well. Yes, absolutely. We um, so the the veterinary anesthesia nerds Facebook page. Um, we started. It was it was actually Tasha that started the group uh, back in 2014, I believe it was, and she contacted myself and then Stephen Seitel. Um, to just serve as administrators for this book. And we never in a million years would we ever envision that it is where it is today. I mean, we're over 31,000 members at this point. And um, these are all veterinary professionals that are members of this group. Mm-hmm. And all we do is talk about anesthesia and analgesia 24 um, 7. And a, a couple, so this was our th- third conference this year, our third symposium, um, we decided, or we were just talking one day and we were like, do you think there would be enough interest for people to actually come in person and listen to anesthesia all day, every day for a couple days worth? Mm -hmm. And so we kind of pulled the membership at the time and there was a huge overwhelming desire to have that, um, so we started planning, and the first year that we had it, the symposium was in Chicago. Um, and then um, uh, this year and last year, we teamed up with WVC in Las Vegas, and they've got a center uh, that has an auditorium, and then it also has areas for labs as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so um, we do a, it's a two day symposium and myself, Stephen and Tasha, we all, uh, do our fair share of providing lectures, but we also, um, every year we'll bring in two anesthesiologists to provide lectures as well. Uh, and so, um, you know, and we just kind of 
by word of mouth or of the anesthesiologists that we know. Um, we will ask them if they will come and spend two days with us really trying to do what our overall goal is, and that is to elevate the standard of care of, of veterinary anesthesia, what people are doing out there in practice. Um, and so that, that's really our overall goal for this is to arm all of our members and those who, who uh, come to the symposium with just information that they can take back to their practices and then, um, you know, better – have it be better anesthesia for their patients. Mm -hmm. So at uh, the time when this comes out, uh, your uh, symposium for this year it w will be uh, will be over. But you're planning an, a new one in October. So, uh... Yes, we are. So we are already uh, in talks with having the symposium again in in uh, 2019. Um, right now, the estimated time frame is going to be sometime in October. It'll probably be in later October this next year. Mm -hmm. um, but and right now, it's looking like we're going to stay with WVC um, as well. So, and the other nice thing about our symposium is that we bring in sponsors. So, all anesthesia-related equipment, um, you know, new drugs that have just been released on the market. Um, so, we really have. These last two years, especially, we've had some wonderful sponsors who really understand the message that we're trying to get across, and their sponsorship has allowed us to showcase, you know, new drugs and new tools that are on the market and available for people to be utilizing in their practices. So, um, without a doubt, we would not be able to do our symposium without the wonderful sponsors that have have um, decided to kind of. Uh, join our cause mm -hmm. and and help us get that message out of there. And would the Facebook group be a good place to to be informed of uh, upcoming symposiums? Or is there anything you'd like to mention here as well? Absolutely. Um, so we do, and you know, we will advocate for any anesthesia related CE. So um, certainly, all of the information about our symposium will be released on our website. Um, or our Facebook page, rather. Um, we, you know, we also advertise on a lot of other veterinary-related Facebook pages as well. Um, but we, you know, any kind of CE. Um, so there's a lot of like online-related um, companies that provide anesthesia CE. So we will advertise all of those offerings. Um, we're big proponents for. Um, promoting veterinary conferences that have anesthesia tracks. Mm -hmm. And so anywhere in the world, um, if there's an anesthesia focused conference going on um, and we know about it, we're going to, we're going to advertise for it and let our members know about it. So okay. yeah, definitely that's a place to come. And uh, just once again, you would just search for veterinary anesthesia nerds on Facebook and you will find it of course. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Uh, and I'll, of course, I will link it, to, link to it as well in the show notes. Excellent. Thank you. So, Darcy, thank you very much for taking the time out and coming on here and and uh, helping us understand and maybe raise a little more awareness of the recovery period. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was it was great talking with you. <laughs> Husk at kigge over på hjemmesiden i noterne til det her afsnit. De ligger på sibp.dk-112. Der er meget at hente, og det går måske også lidt stærkt til tider i det her interview, og det kan være svært at høre det alt sammen på engelsk. Vi har listet det mest relevante og de forskellige stoffer, der også nævner op. De er alle sammen listet op over i artiklen på hjemmesiden sibp.dk-112. Vi høres ved igen på næste søndag. Ha' det godt.